All good. Can, can people hear me okay? Yeah, up the back, all good? Cool. Okay, um, the topic that was it was on the agenda was like its failover thing between Aeolus and OpenStack, but you know we're having some we're integrating another product with it at the moment, so the codes all busted. So if you went to go and try it, wouldn't work. So instead, we're doing introduction to OpenStack. Um, some of you guys, well, you know, this is related, <laughs> so hopefully good. Um, so who am I? Um, I switched across from the Aeolus team about a month ago to a new team called the Open Source and Standards team inside Red Hat. Um, I work in community building roles, roles. I'm a software engineer, so I work on the technical side of stuff. Um, at the moment, I'm working on GlusterFS and integrating it with OpenStack. So thus, the OpenStack knowledge that I've got when you guys ask questions, it will be more on the storage side, I'll be able to answer. If you ask me questions about the in-depth quantum side, which is the networking, and I'll say just email me and I'll get back to you then, right? So <laughs> it's just, that's my knowledge base. Um, also, feel free to email me anytime. Um, I will get back to you with answers and stuff like that. Um, so how many people here have used or looked at OpenStack before? Cool. Um, there's about, what, five of you guys? Out of curiosity, have you guys looked at the RDO thing yet that was launched yesterday? No, yes, yep, okay, yeah. the, the guy that works for Red Hat, yeah, <laughs> so, all good. Okay, um, part of this topic will cover a thing called RDO towards the end of it. Um, several of the people here have looked at OpenStack, some of you guys haven't, it's a cloud software. Red Hat yesterday launched a community version of that specifically for enterprise Linuxes, like, you know, CentOS specifically, CentOS and other things, we'll cover that towards the end. Um, that's a community support, not like, you know, we'll, pay, we'll support people, you know, um, running community versions with cost. So this OpenStack thing, what is it all about? It's a ecosystem and a large group of companies all to, coming together to make an effectively open source version of clone of EC2, Amazon type of thing. I say type of thing a lot open source version of it, but improved, you know? So we get all these different companies like uh, Citrix, HP, NetApp, various other things. And unlike EC2, which is a proprietary closed ecosystem and they do its own thing, places like NetApp, IBM and others who have their own, let's say, storage systems or their own pro you know, proprietary way of doing stuff that want to get into massive scale operations, these places get involved with OpenStack because they can write drivers for themselves and have support for their own products in it. Um, so you'll find that all this list of places over here is heavily involved in OpenStack and uh, you know, there's drivers supporting everything. So this is what a view from the clouds. So rough view from the clouds. So looking down from the clouds about what OpenStack is, OpenStack is for people that uh, want to build public and private clouds. It's Unlike uh, Overt or you know, Rev type of products, which are like an equivalent to VMware and very, very good competitors to VMware, this is purely a project that is made for massive scale, scale out type stuff. It's not something that you actually would want to deploy in a small business on two or three servers and expect that to be a production type of thing. You don't do that. This is really targeted at 100 plus servers to get started. You can run it smaller, but it's not really what it's targeted for. Um, it gives the illusion of infinite resources, you know. Um, its viewpoint is, from an end user's point of view, you know, there's as much of this as they could ever use. From a systems administrator on the back end, you'll be monitoring the hell out of it and actually you'll be aware of what's actually there. So that, yeah, there is a difference. It doesn't just pretend totally or badly. Um, one of the really good things about things like um, OpenStack, when it's done well, the person says, like, launch image, and a few seconds later, it's, it's there, it's ready. It's very, very fast provisioning. If you've ever worked in companies like uh, IBM or things where they go, oh, we need to deploy a new server, and, you know, here's the form about how to get it done, and you do all the paperwork and you submit it and it goes through the chain, three weeks later, you might get a box if something hasn't gone wrong with it. I've worked in places like IBM and in their rapid provisioning teams and things, which take three weeks for rapid provisioning. Um, painful. 
This is like we've probably all used on the internet, you know, almost like running a virtual machine on your laptop. This is the cloud version of doing that. Um, one of the really good things about OpenStack, which a lot of projects don't have, is it started out practically with APIs for everything. So you've got command line tools for doing everything, but you've got REST-based APIs as well. So if you happen to be a programmer or coder or a scripter or anything like that, and you don't like doing stuff from always from the command line or you want to automate it, there's APIs for everything. So if you want to build your own command line interface, use the APIs. It's very API-driven, command line interface-driven. It's extremely customizable. Uh, how many people here, out of curiosity, know Python? Anyone here, Python? OK. OpenStack's written in Python. So if you happen to be a dude that wants to go, yeah, yeah, it's, it's good. Um, is anyone familiar with Django? Yep, OK, Django person as well. Do you do stuff with OpenStack already? No? Yeah? OK. Well, guess what? You're in luck, because OpenStack is written in Python, and there's a web interface for it called Horizon written in Django, so like Django 1.4. Um, most of the logic in OpenStack, when you look at the web interface, most of the horizon, this web interface part, is all very modular. When you see the screenshots later on, they all look very bland and very basic. So you know, you'll have the information, and it's not flash, it's not whiz, it doesn't look super nifty and shiny and that sort of stuff. It's functional. But the modular bits for, with Django is so someone that actually knows their shit can actually go in, look at it, and go, ah, oh, we can make you know, shiny buttons. It's, it's made to be extensible. Part of this whole, here's your building blocks, you go and do it sort of thing. Uh, yeah, so OpenStack core services. Uh, sorry, I get off topic a lot. So if anyone has questions, you actually just go, Justin, here's the question. I'm good with that, OK? So I'm not one of these wait till the end type of speakers. Is that cool with everyone? Yeah? <laughs> Am I speaking too fast? Can everybody understand me? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what? This is the what, Dutch crowd? Oops. <laughs> so, yeah. You are right. <laughs> so, yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> um, I have a habit of speaking too fast in personal life, and when I get into things, I speak fast. So if I do that, tell me to slow down, because I will. It's just... You know, personal thing, you know. Um, now, OpenStack core services. Um, what this is trying to illustrate is you've got this central sort of thing that presents OpenStack, you know, this cloudy sort of thing. You have a bunch of nodes, which are actually your servers, and these nodes do things like compute node, which um, is everyone here familiar with EC2? Yep, EC2, Amazon, have used. Okay, a show of I'll say show of hands. Has anyone actually used it? Yeah, cool, okay. We have three, four people. Sweet. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a start. Yeah. Um, so I'll get into the project breakdown later on and what the individual parts are. But, you know, it's a normal everyday sort of cloud virtualization type thing. You have your, you know, this is the cloud and the ways to access it. This is showing that you have your OpenStack web interface. There are screenshots later. So that's this, you know, boring sort of thing that's, you know, extremely customizable Django sort of stuff. You've got your REST API to access the different parts of it, which is, you know, normal. And, uh, yeah, you've got all the back-end stuff that just hooks into it. Um, nodes being just, you know, the servers that you have hooked up, normal everyday server sort of stuff. A bunch of components will go into it at the moment. The core, one of the core things to think about with OpenStack is like Lego blocks. You've got all these different components, and when you see the diagrams later on, it's not a simple structure. It's really, things are everywhere. Um, it's a cloud service. It's not, you know, it's not simple when you actually get into development for this thing of what does what. If you're like me and you're in the storage sort of stuff, like I'm very focused on the whole Cinder thing recently, just because that's you know what my work involves, and I can't tell you jack about how the inner fundamentals of quantum being the networking service works. You'll find that if you get into the OpenStack thing, you get a broad overview quickly, and then whatever the interesting part that you find is, you'll get into that and you know, it'll be optional later on if you get into the other stuff. It's just, yeah, you know, most open source projects are like this, so don't expect it to be any different. OpenStack's point of view, though, is it's all made from the design to be like Lego blocks. Uh, and this is why so many external companies are involved in this, because 
you've got these APIs that everything follows, you've got these command line tools that use the APIs, and you've got this web interface that also uses the APIs. So these companies come along, they, can, they go, well, for example, NetApp, just as an example, so this is a purely example, okay? So a company like NetApp comes along and says, well, we can rip out this component, put our own component in there, you know, NetApp, of course, being very fast storage for, for NAS type stuff, and you know, as long as we have an interface that does the API, it's completely transparent. It works well. It's, um, so yeah, a lot of people come along, they have their own products, and they think, hmm, we can rip our XYZ component, shove our own in there, and as long as our component has like this API and answers the APIs properly, totally transparent. So if you guys, once you get into OpenStack development at all, as a thought, that's how you do it, you know. Identify the component, get your own instead, you know, make sure your API works with it, and voila, that'll work. Then you, can, then you try and get it upstream. So if you've got an open source project, you know, that it does something like, you know, storage, networking, or whatever, then you get it upstream, and voila, you've got support in OpenStack, you know, using the marketing material. Make sense? Cool. Um, yeah, so that's what every company's done in the short form. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, with some differences. Um, I look at, you know, I add, I, you know, I generalize a lot, right? So don't get too stressed about that. Yeah, so what makes up OpenStack? Um, you've got a thing that spins up the VMs, which is Nova. That's Nova, which spins up actual virtual machines. Uh, compute node, that's the equivalent to EC2 in Amazon. You've got Glance, which is like a, uh, it's like, sort of like a metadata service. It's hard to sort of describe that in an accurate way, other than saying that, uh, Nova talks to it and actually gets virtual machine images from it and puts other metadata to do with virtual machines and other things in this glance thing. And, sorry, and yeah, so it's sort of like a metadata server. Um, all of these are, by the way, extremely replicated, extremely distributed, and broken up into tons of little components. You can put each component on individual servers and scale them out too. So this is a simple sort of diagram, but the actual implementation can get kind of tricky, which, you know, this thing I'll show you later simplifies it. So we've got Nova, the compute, we've got Glance, which is the metadata. Swift is like an object storage. It's, uh, it's kind of like, if people are familiar with S3 in Amazon, it's where, you know, you have this container, you put files and other objects that you want. You can't create a directory structure as well. You can't mount a directory structure, even though you can create manually a tree structure, but just think, if you're familiar with S3, that's what Swift is. The actual implementation is an extremely distributed, extremely replicated um, file system, basically. You know, it's fairly, fairly rugged, but, you know, it's reputation for being a bit of a pain in the ass, just saying, <laughs> you know. Uh, lots of file systems are. Quantum, plug and play networking, apparently. I don't know much about this just because I have not personally yet touched this, but it's... Software-defined networking is a buzzword people are using these days. That's got something to do with it. That's all I know. <laughs> so, so, if that makes sense. Um, Cinder volume service. If you guys are familiar with um, elastic block storage in Amazon, which is uh, purely large-scale files, like, you know, image files of, like, when I say image files, I mean, like, you know, your 20 gigabyte sort of virtual machine image files or additional storage. None of these 2K, 3K, 4K files. It's Cinder is uh, made for, you know, fast giving of large block objects. Uh, uh, Keystone is an authentication and identity service. So, for anyone here ever used the thing like OpenID? Yep, cool. Okay, if I ask a question, guys, and if instead of nodding, because I my vi eyesight sucks, so if I ask questions, say, so, hey, have you? Yeah, yeah, exactly like that. <laughs> so, does that make sense? If I okay, so two people are still listening. Fuck. <laughs> so, anyway, um, yeah, so Keystone is something that ties into everything. Anytime you want to access a service, Keystone is your authentication mechanism. It, you know, every request through an API, through everything, Keystone. Via the command line, goes through Keystone. So when you implement anything, Keystone is one of the very first things you get up and running because without it, everything's not there, right? Nothing will talk to each other. And the web user interface is called Horizon. Uh, dashboard, this simplistic sort of stuff, screenshots later. Uh, okay, and I've just gone through the entire slide deck. 
verbally. <laughs> so we'll probably just skip forward a few. Um, yeah, so the Nova thing. This is Nova. Like I said, the whole thing is really super complex. This is the first component, right? So um, has anyone here used uh, message, message bus type stuff, like uh, AMQP type things? Yeah. OK, yeah. Good, yeah, you guys are like, you seem to be on the right track to just slot into the whole OpenStack thing very, very easily. Um, pretty much everything in, communicates inside OpenStack via message bus type stuff, just because it's ordered messages. And once you've got one of these things running, you just push everything at it, it takes care of that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I've, I've had experience in other projects before that didn't use that approach, you know, trying to do publish subscriber type things and all sorts of stuff, painful. This approach is you know, much cleaner, much more scalable, and you can, um, in theory, you're supposed to be able to put in any kind of message bus. I don't know that anyone's actually doing that. I mean, I think the terms RabbitMQ, I think, is in there, as well as AMQP, and it's not something I've ever touched personally that much yet. I've, I've seen it at a distance, so if you're into that kind of stuff, look at that type of stuff as well. Um, yeah, so. Who here has used libvert before, or seen or heard of libvert? Yeah? Got the hands happening, cool, yeah. Okay, no, this is a good thing, you know? Um, so yeah, so libvert and KVM, pretty much, you guys that have touched libvert have probably looked at libvert and KVM. Um, you know, so that's like, you know, running on Linux type stuff. The compute start for spinning up virtual machines uses libvert in the background and KVM in the background. They're not the only hypervisor technologies that can be used, but you know, by default, if you, especially if you um, download the Red Hat version of this free community thing for CentOS, you're gonna be running, of course, KVM, right? It's not gonna like, let you hook into you know, Hyper-V so easily. I mean, it probably would if you try, but it's not built for that, right? Um, now, the point is, if you're familiar with libvert, when you start up a virtual machine in any of these, if you're familiar with uh, Virtual Machine Manager and you just happen to start that up, you'll see all your virtual machines running in that as well. So it uses on the back end of OpenStack technologies that you're familiar with. It can also use things like uh, Overt or Rev. If the Red Hat guy out the back is listening, no, he's not. He's completely, <laughs> he's working, it's okay. <laughs> so, <coughs> I had, <coughs> ah, <laughs> so, no, it's all good. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, so Red Hat's a relaxed company to work for, I'll say, <laughs> so it's all good. Um, yeah, so it, can, it doesn't have to use libvert and that. It can, use, it can use things like overt and rev, but, you know, by default, most things you'll see will run. Can I use overt and rev? Because I think it's not possible at the Yeah, look, I've seen some guys that were talking about demoing it. Um, which means that they've, you know, you'd be kind of hoping that the code was written when they said that. I don't know if it's upstream, but I know it's possible. And those particular guys, um, they were saying it in response to somebody else that wanted that feature. And so I would assume very strongly that that will be upstream in the code base, you know, at some point in the near future. I mean, one, one thinks, you know. Does that make sense? Mr. Overt guy over there? <laughs> All good. Um, yeah, so uh, you'll find with a lot of the OpenStack different components, you know, this like storage component and this compute component, and many of them, many of them are broken up into the actual component that does the work. You know, it's like a, you know, if you do like a check config from a rel box or CentOS box, you'll see like a list of services, and you'll see the component name, like uh, OpenStack hyphen Cinder hyphen volume is the actual thing that does the work for that bit of, for that particular purpose. You'll also th see like a scheduler version of everything. So OpenStack Cinder, as an example, has OpenStack Cinder Scheduler. You'll see an API, different service again. So most of the services you, the, a part of OpenStack have like an API, scheduler, and they're separate daemons. So when you do a check config, you get this huge ass list of different services. Pain in the ass if you have to manually sort of, you know, start and stop everything. You will script that yourself. Um, yeah, so Glance is this metadata thing. It's a, uh, because OpenStack is so made with so many different companies hooking in, it's just following this API thing, the backends that you can use for most of these things, it just, you know, depends on what vendors and what open source projects have contributed stuff. So the backend for Glance is usually Swift, but it doesn't have to be. So you can use Gloucester as an example as a backend, although I haven't written it there. Um, yeah, 
the, the glance for the image things supports all different types of files, um, file formats. So you've got your raw files. If you just, you know, you make your disk, that's it. No special compression, no special format. You know, it's just done. You've got your QCOW2, you've got your VMware, you've got your Microsoft, you've got your ISOs, you know, most people will be familiar with that, and your AMIs. Um, I don't know so much about AKIs. I'm guessing it's something to do with Amazon, so some of you guys might know. And your OVF format as well. Um, Glance, it can be used for like, you know, it's because it's an image store, well, because it's a metadata store, it could be used for private and public sort of stuff, but yeah, not a big detail. You guys will figure it out when and if you try this, by the way, which, which you should. You'll find that you know, actually trying this stuff out is super straightforward. Uh, image service glance, yeah. Okay, um, Swift, small, so Amazon S3. Um, like things like Ceph, like things like Gluster, it's made for commodity hardware. Um, unlike Gluster, it's a bit of a pain. It's, it's got a reputation for all good when it's all scripted and stuff. More interesting if things go wrong. Haven't touched it myself much yet, so this could just be impressions of people that have told me, so, you know. Um, it's made for scale out type things as well. So, you know, just plug in more servers and it'll take care of most of the operations as you add more boxes. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's, has anyone here used Ceph? Cool. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's all good. I mean, you know, it's these it, crowd that's got, you know, knowledge. I haven't touched Ceph myself, but it's got a reputation for extremely good performance in certain situations, but you really have to know the knobs to tweak. Is that an accurate way of looking at it, or, or is it just works? Basically, just works. Cool, okay. In that case, you know, you might want to see if there's a back end for If you, you do this, you might want to see if there's a Ceph back end. I'll, I'll just put a plug in now. The Gluster FS actually works like that too. <laughs> it just works normally. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I do stuff with Gluster, so, you know. Um, I haven't touched Ceph yet, so thus the, you know, thus the question. Ah, moving along. Let's see. Yeah, like, like most of the services, it's an API thing, and there's the actual part which does stuff. So in OpenStack... Again, API daemon for practically every, every individual service, and there's something behind it, you know, this you know, daemon behind it which actually does the work with schedulers in between to actually say which node gets what. Um, dashboard. This is the Horizon web interface. Um, modular Django web application, as, as mentioned before, so if you want to get it and make a knockoff clone of OpenStack, go right ahead, honestly, <laughs> you know with pretty interface, rebadge it or whatever, it's all cool. It's made for doing that. You're quite welcome to. Um, provides end user and administrator user interface, which is, you know, why it hooks into uh, Keystone for authentication. So the same uh, web-based web interface, you know, you can swap between, you know, admin user and normal user, but you have to sign out, sign in. It all looks the same for normal users and admin users. Um, yeah, and plug-in architecture so other projects can add their, actually, that's probably sounding better now, yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, plug-in architecture, so if you happen to have your own open source project or your own company and you've added support to it in the APIs and scheduler, you can also add support to it through the actual Horizon web interface. If you happen to be doing stuff with an open source project that, you know, you'd like it, can, you know, you would like full support in, you can contribute upstream that modular part and actually have it included in main OpenStack as well. Uh, places like NetApp have done similar as long as the drivers and the widget bits that they do um, are open source, you know, because obviously all the code for this is open source. So yeah, I mean, as a curiosity question, how many people here um, are from doing stuff with an open source project? I mean, are anybody here involved in their own open source projects? Okay, yeah, 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 cool. Okay, so is anybody here from a company that's thinking maybe they could get their products into OpenStack or something if it was the right fit? Okay, well, you know, so all you guys are potential people that could get your thing into OpenStack, whatever your thing happens to be, you know, if it, if it makes sense to. Um, massive amount of uh, media and publicity, of course, around OpenStack, so, you know, that's a, a plus. 
Um, and you get you know, tons of really, really, really professional coders that review people's code and look over it because everything is reviewed by a bunch of people. But you know, your product has to be good. <laughs> Does it make sense? So, um, so hopefully everyone's products here are actually you know, rigid -dig and useful for like, you know, wider community. Uh, so this is the non-super non fancy looking web interface. Um, I tried to get a, a, a live running demo before, but you know, trying to get like a bridged connection on a you know um, wireless isn't such a happening thing. So yeah, no live demo. So it's just going to be screenshots. Sorry, but yeah. So this is the Horizon web interface. I think everyone can say that we've all seen prettier web interfaces in our lives. However, it is completely functional. So it's minimalistic, and for people that want to customize it, it's actually easy to do so. Some of the uh, commercial places that provide OpenStack, if you go and look at their web, web interface after you've seen this, you can see where they've actually done exactly that. You know? And they've made quite, these quite pretty web interfaces that actually look pretty cool. And you wouldn't, if you didn't know any better, you wouldn't know it was something that they've just made at all you know, whiz-bang, just out of this common sort of framework with their own extensions. Uh, instances and snapshots page, yeah, everything is just, you know, um, like standard sort of standard way of looking at things, menu left hand side, individual type of um, individual items to do stuff with on the right hand side. Yeah, I'm over here to get a different perspective. Different people asleep? No? Yeah? <laughs> so, it's cool. Um, yeah, so images and snapshots, you know, it's all good. Basic web interface. And Keystone, the identity service. Um, it's token based, like everything else, pluggable backends for everything. So you've got like SQL, PAM, LDAP, key value stores, tons of different things, depends upon what you want in your environment. Um, if you've got an environment that wants to do, for example, Active Directory, it wouldn't surprise me if there was an Active Directory plugin. If not, and you want to write one, go for it, you know? Yeah, support that originally. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah, see, so, you know. It, Good that there are people in the audience that actually know this sort of stuff. So if I raise a, raise a dumb point, they can say, actually, <laughs> it's all cool. Um, so yeah, now Keystone provides uh, service catalogs and endpoints. What that means is when Keystone starts up, it has its own internal list of what, things, what parts of OpenStack should be available to it. So um, whenever you start up an OpenStack server, let's say, if you start up, for example, the OpenStack all-in-one server, which is you know, this super simplified installation approach you'll see later on. When you start that up, it's got a whole bunch of services you would see like in, if you do check config, like you know, Cinder, Nova, and all the different parts of that. Whenever they start up, what they will do is they'll all try and talk to Keystone and say, hey, I'm here, I'm available. And they do that in a loop. As uncomplicated as that is, it's because it's a real pain in the ass to have to guarantee service order starts in a certain order and things break if they don't. It's just not the right way to do things, especially in an environment that's totally you know, redundant, distributed, and supposed to be fault tolerant. So they just start up in a real simple repeat loop, practically every service that there is. So when Keystone finally starts up, these things will actually talk to it, authenticate, and go, OK, you know, I'm here. So your Cinder service will do that. Your Cinder volume will do that. You know, your Nova scheduler will do that. But they all do this sort of stuff. What that means is after you've started up your box, give it a minute or so, everything's all talking happily to each other. In, that, in the in-between meantime, you know, you're not quite sure what state things are as they start getting themselves hooked in. Uh, when you actually come to looking at this sort of stuff on a running box, don't get freaked out if in a log file it's, you'll see an entry like cannot talk to Keystone service or cannot find whatever you know, near the startup of a session. It just means it's you know, doing its thing starting up. If you get a lot of them and they're still going, it's like can't talk to, can't talk to, can't talk to after half an hour, you've got a problem, right? That's, that's the service you want to look at if there's something wrong. Um, yeah, so everything like everything, it's a REST API for the API. Um, there's catalogs, policy, identity, and tokens. Mm. Mm. Difficult to go into too much detail with this. I don't know each of these bits in a huge amount of detail at the moment. It's just, you know, I just authenticate to the thing and it does, does what it does. Um, quantum, this is the bit that I am not real sure of. 
Um, this is my area of weakness, and I will. This is something I will get into soon. But this is. Um, I know it uses libvirt for the libvirt type stuff, and it sets up virtual networks. So you can sort of say, via the API for this quantum thing, create network over here of this endpoint between these machines, and it magically does it. I don't know the details of how it does this, but apparently it's all good. If you guys happen to be into networking, you'll look at this and go, wow, what an idiot Justin was. It, it's so easy. <laughs> good luck to you. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, so it's... Has anyone here heard of Project Daylight? Yeah? No? Okay, the red hat guy in the back, yeah. <laughs> um, it was recently announced, like two or three days ago, this thing called Project Daylight. And it has... Who here has heard of software-defined networking? Okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's a few more. Um, in the SDN space, this thing called Project Daylight, um, for the people that don't know, SDN is our software-defined networking. It's kind of like this... It's mm, hard to describe. It's kind of like this standard API you can write to that sort of says, I want my network to be like this, to make changes in your network, which at the moment, you know, you have to know vendor-specific things like Cisco and, uh, you know, Nortel, Juniper, specific ways of doing things for specific switches is, is my best understanding of it. The software-defined networking is trying to implement or provide a common API that you can sort of you know, talk to this API and in the background the software does it. This same API can actually be on switches. So you can actually talk to a switch via this API and it does this configuration. So regardless of vendor or even if you're using a, a software version of SDN type thing, it will, you know, one API you talk to and it takes care of the, the configuration that you want for the network. Uh, this project Daylight was a bunch of companies sort of getting together and making an industry sort of forum about, okay, we're going to have a common protocol and a common working thing for doing this. Previously, the SDN has been startup companies generally and a couple of you know, big names trying to you know, differentiate themselves from their competitors. And soft, uh, Project Daylight is a, you know, like a vendor and project group to get, that got together to actually do this in a better sort of way. Uh, launched two days ago, you'll hear more about it over the next couple of weeks and months, I guess. Um, so this SDN thing, Quantum provides the SDN layer, let's say, for OpenStack. Um, yeah. Has anyone else just noticed that I say um quite a lot? <laughs> well, I just did. <laughs> really? I'll notice that next. <laughs> the other one is awesome and interesting, or the other two. So. <laughs> I can get most conversations done by awesome, interesting, cool, and um. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Now, so Cinder, this is the block storage thing. This is the part that I'm most familiar with already, you know, because of doing work with it. Um, this is, you know, good training for me. It's like, <laughs> um, cool. <laughs> when OpenStack first started up, or originally started up, one of the very first things to get up and running was its EC2 equivalent called Nova, which is what spins up virtual machines and does them according to whatever size. Because it's the first of the OpenStack components and the oldest, people kept adding features to it. It got hairy complicated, like spaghetti type thing. So people that wanted to add new features to it, after some time, only the people that had been around for ages and knew all the bits, only they were able to really do it easily. So it became too complicated. So a few releases ago, they started thinking, we need to simplify this. So they started, you know, they've started on this path of making some of the components of Nova into their own sub-projects and breaking them out. Cinder is one such component. So in the most recent release of OpenStack, Cinder you know, became a fully-fledged component of its own. Um, Nova still has the, the APIs and does the command line stuff that Cinder does, but it's like deprecated. It still will work, but things shouldn't, should use Cinder instead of the part of Nova that used to do that. And you'll see that this will happen for other projects in the future as well, as they break things out, the bits that are too complicated, and simplify them. So yeah, this is provides block storage for instances. Yep, sorry. 
variance do you expect to be split out into their own projects in the future? Um, good question. I'm not sure. Email me. Yeah? <laughs> um, Cinder was one of them. The I have seen mention of other ones. It's just at the moment my brain isn't saying this is what they are. So, but I mean, a quick Google search will probably tell you. But if not, email me, and I will get it back to you. I am the kind of person you can email, and I will get it back to you. It won't be within five minutes, but it, you know, whenever I wake up next and actually ask the right people the right questions and you know, get it back to you. So uh, my email address is at the bottom of that of, of every slide. The slides will go up on the website. I'm guessing. Um, if not Google search, you'll find it really easy. I am not a hard person to find via email and things. Um, yeah, and of course GlusterFS, which is the bit that I do, um, support was added for that in Grizzly. So there's a GlusterFS driver in Grizzly. There's also a Ceph driver for it in Grizzly, being the name of the latest release. Uh, let's see. Uh, there is... Up until now, with OpenStack, it's been a very, you know, you spin up a virtual machine, you do your thing. If you need two virtual machines to all talk to, to each other, have dependencies on software that run together, it's been up to you to do that. You know, you must put your own HA layer above or orchestration layer above that. Some of the guys that work for Red Hat did this, you know, we're getting into this whole orchestration thing pretty heavily in one of our cloud projects. And they said, well, you know, we could do that for OpenStack because OpenStack is written in Python. They know Python well. And what they were already doing was what some of the guys that already worked on OpenStack were sort of saying, we need something like this. So those guys got, well, put together a spec and then wrote a thing called Heat. Heat it does orchestration and high availability for OpenStack. Apparently, it's pretty good. I haven't tried it. I've seen demos of it, but I don't understand high availability quite yet. I understand orchestration. So has anyone here used WordPress at all? Does anyone here understand what WordPress is? Yeah, cool. OK, yeah, cool. OK, so just for the people that didn't put their hand up, it's um, WordPress is like blogging software. And if you set up a really super simple install of WordPress, it's like a web server and a database, like PHP type thing and MySQL type thing as examples. An example of what orchestration is about is when you set up one VM as a MySQL server, another VM as the web server, and you set up the configuration so they'll start up in the right order and they'll pass the right information to each other automatically. You don't need to do that manually via SSH scripts or anything. So for example, um, when you start up an OpenStack instance, same as if you've done this in EC2 or any of the other cloud providers, yeah? Similar sort of thing. I haven't yet touched UU or however it's pronounced. I don't know if it's UU, UU. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I, know, I know the thing that you mean. They do some sort of orchestration type of thing. I would suspect it's something similar. Um, it is similar, but it's um, not nearly the same because UU is able to um, create some instances, but it's not able to talk to Cinder, etc. And um, OpenStacking is talking to all the services you've got. Mm -hmm. That's the big benefit of Interesting, cool. So we have someone that knows heat, so it's all good. I haven't yet run it, so if I say something stupid, say, Justin, by the way. <laughs> okay, well, you know. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, so um, yeah, so like all the other services, it uses an API, but the orchestration part is you can sort of say, okay, this instance needs to know, for example, the IP address of the other instance when it starts up. So for example, you'll have like a MySQL server startup, and OpenStack will give it an IP address, and it will need to be provided with a username and password, so that goes in the template or gets randomly generated, however you tell it to, to do it. But it can, when it knows its IP address, it can automatically provide that to the web server. And the web server will then start up and know to talk back to the MySQL instance. So they'll always start up in the right order, and you'll never get these, you know, 404 page can't be found type thing in your WordPress instance. So orchestration is about passing information between services and them knowing what should be where in what order. That hooks into the high availability part, is my understanding, because when one of those goes away, it makes another one or something like that. I, I don't know the details, but you can find it out pretty easily. Um, uh, yeah, and they, they say that you, part of the way of doing that is uh, by versioning. So, you know, if you've got version one of your WordPress deployment out there, you can change things and make like version two, and it will actually do it properly and not get confused. 
and you know, so you'll, it, it understands the different versions of things that you put out there. Um, let's see, yeah, yeah, well-known templates and API. Has anyone used AWS CloudFormation at all? Yeah, okay, yeah, so that's, a, that's the proprietary version of doing that, that you know, they've basically sort of looked at it and said, we can do that better. So Heat, Heat actually copies their you know, API, so if you have something that works to the AWS CloudFormation API or templates for it, you can use them with Heat and it'll just you know, c convert them automatically and it'll just work. Yeah, my understanding is. Uh, so yeah, so that sort of goes under, that, the heat part sort of goes across everything and runs with all the other components. Um, has auto scaling features too. I haven't touched that, but apparently if load gets high enough on the boxes at certain thresholds, it can spin up more instances automatically. I think that's pretty cool, as long as it knows how to spin them back down and that again. Apparently it does. Um, in previous versions of OpenStack, the, not the one that was released like two weeks ago, heat was incubation, sort of like, I'll see if it gets popularity. It did, so it's now a graduated out of incubation into a main OpenStack project. So this is a attempt to simply show you, this is the simple version of what OpenStack actually looks like and how the bits talk to each other. So you have like your dashboard, which is this horizon thing, it's, you know, talks to the object storage cinder and, you know, network quantum. As you can see, that looks fairly complicated, yeah? Who here has memorized that already? Yeah, no one, yeah? Sorry, Who here has memorized this already? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's all good. One moment, please. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, you know. But I've seen the other picture as well. Yeah, it's, it, yeah the, this, is the, this is the next picture. This is the slightly more accurate version, as in this is getting better. If you then drill into it more, which I don't have the picture for, because this was just you know, copied off the OpenStack website because it's an easy picture. Um, but yeah, it is complicated software, so don't expect to jump in and just know all of it in depth in a day. The guys that do know things to that, de to that depth are very far and few between. Most of them work for Red Hat, I think, but not really. <laughs> Many of them do. But um, yeah, you know, when you get into it, you find your bit and you do it well. And that's normally how it goes. So who should use OpenStack? At the moment, it's... Has anyone here used any of the other major cloud sort of platforms, open source ones, like your Open Nebula, your, yeah, cool. Um, you know, those guys are generally, f they've been around longer. You know, they've got, you know, frameworks that do stuff. They're, some parts of them are more mature, this sort of stuff. It's all true. Cloud Stack is another competitor. What none of them seems to have is huge amount of uptake of developers. The community, that I've seen around OpenStack is mind-blowingly moving forwards. It's a huge amount of commits, tons of people reviewing stuff, very engaged community of people. Um, it's, I used to do stuff with Postgres many, many years ago when it was starting to become really, really popular, doing, you know, managing community sort of stuff for it. And there were times in that particular community where, for example, we got the .org domain name, you know, the registrar that got .org, started running Postgres and tons of press and marketing, you know, went nuts. You know, if they had Twitter, that, which they didn't back then, it would have just gone spastic. You know, I was getting emails every six minutes, you know, 24-7 for some time. This is the kind of thing, this is what OpenStack is like at the moment. And it seems to be, it's not even near its top. It's, it's really full on. If you want to see a group of really passionate, enthusiastic people into OpenStack with extreme freaking tunnel vision, this is, this is how you do it. You know, you take a look at the OpenStack community. They are really active, like really, really active. It's not just all these companies. It's so many open source projects that have heard about it that have their own thing are going, wonder if we can use OpenStack. I wonder if we can integrate with OpenStack. It's because of the amount of marketing from various companies. It's pro, pro, our amount of media and amount of change happening with it. It's like this self-propagating sort of thing. It's really steamrolling, frigging everything. But what that means is, if you want something and you're a small shop and you want to put it into production tomorrow, this is not the solution that you want. 
you want to find a mature solution that's been around your, your over or your rev if you want a small sort of setup. Um, if you're a medium sized shop or a larger sort of shop that is thinking, you know, okay, we've got staff, we can do this sort of stuff, we've got enough, you know, inbuilt resources to do this, and we want to build our own bits, or we're comfortable building our own bits, OpenStack is very much something that you want to be part of. It's just, you know, try it out, get familiar with it, make, you, make your own decisions. Um, DevOps teams seem to like it because um, many places use Puppet in ext extensively with it. Our super simple in installation approach for the community version, you know, runs Puppet in the background. So, you know, it's manifests and everything. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, the Red Hat, the mandatory Red Hat mention. Yeah. Um, we have an early adopter program in Red Hat for this, you know, OpenStack type stuff. I don't know much about it because I'm not on the product side. <laughs> you know, if you want it, talk to Red Hat sales, you know, they'll figure it. Um, I'm more on the community side, so. <laughs> um, OpenStack deployment. Mm. How many of you guys work in places like uh, IBM or huge ass corporates? You know, like tons and tons and tons of people. No? Nobody? Cool. Okay. Places like IBM, you you'll, might have seen in the media, they have their own implementations of OpenStack and, and they do things because they've got friggin' whole divisions, you know, floors full of people to do this and they write their own bits. That was sort of like the early audience for the OpenStack thing. These places with huge amounts of resources, they would get into it. Uh, we're trying with this new release of uh, RDO, which is what we call it, the community version, this community release, openstack.redhat.com. It's made for people that want to try it out on a CentOS or Scientific Linux or RHEL platform. Try it out, have a go. It sets everything up in one box. You know, it's options to, to scale it out more than that. You know, but you get the web interface, you get all the APIs, you get everything. You know, you, you can run it pretty easily. I also get it for Debian. <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure Debian has its own version already, like DevStack and TriStack and these other things. So we've got a thing called PackStack, which is the uh, the CentOS version sort of thing. Um, but I mean, if you want to port it to Debian, go for it. <laughs> you know, upstream will accept contributions. All cool. Wouldn't surprise me. So, yeah, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> so, good question. So, I think you've used Debian and Ubuntu before, yeah? Sorry? Have you used Debian and Ubuntu much? Mm, a bit, yeah. Yeah, okay, it's just a question. So, so, that might be more your kind of thing if you want to try it out and, you know. Um, so, OpenStack releases. Uh, as you can see, it's only been releasing stuff for a few years. Uh, the release cycle for OpenStack is every six months, major release. So we had a release about uh, two weeks ago, I think it was the last, maybe three weeks ago, was the last OpenStack release, that was Grizzly. Um, and each release for the you know, past couple of years, you know, you'll see different things happening. So this release in Grizzly was where we got the GlusterFS drivers in, where uh, Heat, that orchestration thing, got into incubation. There's a project called Sealometer, which is like metering and billing. So people that want to internally, uh, you know, measure how much particular groups of users have used stuff so they can bill internally or bill externally. Sealometer is a project for doing that. Um, I haven't touched it yet, so I can't really sort of give demos or say what, much about that. But yeah, so those projects, Heat and Sealometer, are in the Grizzly release as incubation. The next release, they've been accepted into the next release, Havana, in about six months. They'll be, you know, main projects, not incubation projects. Uh, launched yesterday, literally about 18 hours ago now, this RDO thing. Uh, RDO is the Red Hat version of OpenStack Easy Installer. It's, you know, you literally go to OpenStack at redhat.com. Red and three steps to install. It's for Red Hat Linux, Enterprise, you know, any of the derivatives of, of, of Red Hat Linux. Um, you'll have seen, or maybe have noticed previously, that Red Hat's been a bit like, meh, towards things like CentOS. You know, it's just, 
Red Hat as a company is not a single culture. We have different teams that do different things. Some of them love CentOS. You know, I'm, I'm on the fan of CentOS side because it gets our stuff out there. You know, some of the teams aren't. So this is by a team that's very CentOS happy. Uh, so yeah, so I know for sure this runs on CentOS because I run CentOS on a lot of stuff to make sure it works. Um, released yesterday at the OpenStack Summit. If you happen to be running Fedora 18 or 19, it will work on that. But you know, its, it's main thing is CentOS. Uh, the, there is a quick start on there. It's three steps. It's literally cut and paste. So if you've got a CentOS box or a roll box, you literally cut and paste. Yum install this, yum install that, do that, done. Give it 10 minutes, it installs everything, and then you can like log in to the Horizon web user interface and you're all good. Uh, yeah, I'm getting towards time too, so not too bad timing because we're nearly at the end. In fact, I'm going to be not eight minutes early. <laughs> so, uh, useful links. So RDO, openstack.redhat.com. Take a look. It's got forums. It's got, you know, quick start instructions, links to other things. Um, yeah, links to the docs like how to integrate GlusterFS, if that's your sort of thing. If anyone wants to write docs up on how to integrate Ceph with it, friggin' anything, write it and put the link on there. It's all good. So community-oriented site. Um, main, the main website for OpenStack is that, um, openstack.org. Upstream, proper upstream for OpenStack is on Launchpad, which is the Ubuntu Launchpad sort of web platform. And there's an IRC channel on Freenode under OpenStack. Uh, that's the end of that. Does anyone here have questions? Do you, yes, no? Oh, come on, someone must have a question. OK, a question. <laughs> Can I use OpenStack across multiple data centers? Hmm. I am pretty sure that the most recent release of OpenStack allows you to do that now. I'm, there's a thing called cells, which is previously scalability for OpenStack was it would scale to like a, tons of machines in a data center. But my understanding it was is it wasn't so good at managing all of them from one spot. Whereas the recent release compartmentalizes data centers into something called cells which is specifically so you can manage across data centers from one spot. I don't know any more detail than that, but you know, as over the years as OpenStack has you know, gotten bigger and bigger, people are starting to actually fill in, the, fill in the blank spots where it's not been such good. And that is one of the things that people have said, needs to get better at that, and so people are working on it. So take a look at it. I know the capabilities in there. I don't know how mature it is. Cool. Um, anyone else have good questions, interesting questions? Do you know something about any, I think this is um, uh, kind of um, optimistic, about some live CD or something like this RDO where I can just boot up a small, tiny, uh, on a single server installed uh, OpenStack, um, which is using my physical hardware there? Um, just for tryouts. Um, yeah, th th now, this particular thing here, this, this RDO thing, it, it's made to, you know, you install it on bare metal or virtual machine or whatever, it does everything and sets everything up on one box. So it's all. But if I install it within a virtual machine, mm -hmm. I think it's kind of hard to spawn up a new virtual no. machine within uh, the virtual machine. Yep. Um, if you can do nested virtualization in your virtual machine, it does work. If you can't do it, it that's not going to work. You have to do it on bare metal. So I don't know of an easy way around that. Um, most hardware these days, if it's reasonably in the last two years, will do nested virtualization if the software supports it. Uh, the KVM software here, if you're running CentOS, I know it does. Um, I haven't tried it with some of the other variants, but you know, try it out. There isn't an easily downloadable VMware image or VirtualBox image or anything yet. If you want to make one and chuck it up, you know, we'll probably link to it. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, it's all good. Yeah, look, if you want to do stuff with the Django interface, you'll find the community is actually a really responsive community. You know, the, in the IRC channel, if you jump in and you ask questions, or the mailing lists, these guys are really helpful. It's, they're, they're, you know, it's, um, as long as you're in the same sort of time zone as these guys, and many of them are in the UK, London, and US time zones, you're cool. 
You know, if you happen to be in Australia like I have been, because I'm an Australian, that can get more interesting. You know, you start doing the whole midnight shift. I was pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, but if you're in the similar time zone, you, you're sweet, right? It, it's all good. Um, well, I think that wraps the presentation. And, okay, thanks, guys. Cool. Who's asleep? No one that puts a hand? Anyway, cool. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Chad.